Greetings and welcome to Ebenezer Baptist Church, Vancouver, for this time of worship and word and prayer and praise. Wherever you are, we welcome you. Whatever your situation, we're with you as we enter into worship together. Every time we gather in this way, we do so in the mighty name of Jesus, who calls us together as children of God, by grace through faith in him. So we begin today by affirming his glory and humility in the words of our call to worship from Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death upon the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we proclaim him as Lord as we continue in worship with the hymn, May the Mind of Christ My Saviour. at him we see the servant king who came as a helpless babe. Give 
Let's bow our heads. And yes, Lord, as we join together to worship you, to share and study your word, to bring you our prayers and praises today, we do so before our servant God, King Jesus, who gave his life on the cross to pay the price for our sins, and then rose again victoriously on the third day, conquering sin, death, and evil once and for all. And we look forward to the consummation of his kingdom at the end of history as we know it. In the meantime, Lord, help us to worship in spirit 
and in truth. May our ears and our hearts be open to your word. And may we be ready to do our part to extend his kingdom in this life. We pray all this in Jesus' name, by your Holy Spirit. Amen. And this morning's reading, as we continue our series in Mark's Gospel, is from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of others. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, Pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of Christ. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you for your word as we study this passage from Mark chapter 9 today. Help us to understand it better, not just to understand it, but to be ready to apply your truth in our everyday lives. Enlighten our minds and our hearts, we pray, so that we may see and hear wonderful things in your word and be ready to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was the British historian Lord Acton who once wrote that power tends to corrupt, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we don't have to look very far to see the truth of that statement. Recent centuries have been littered with examples of a people who have achieved very great power only to cause unspeakable damage by misusing it, like 
Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Closer to hand and, and on a much smaller scale, of course, even the democratic political systems of BC and Canada have had their own stories of corruption. But it isn't just those who rise to positions of significant political or executive authority or influence who can be troubled by such issues. Many of us would have to admit that we'd rather be in control than have someone else be, if we're honest. The Bible teaches that people are naturally rebellious and self-serving. That's one of the main reasons why we tend to have problems with authority. That's one of the reasons why we can so often push ourselves forward to seek fame or fortune or achievement. That's why we can find it so difficult to accept God's guidelines, God's principles for our lives. And these challenges don't stop when we become Christians. So what's the answer? There may be little danger, hopefully there's none, of anyone watching this now becoming another Saddam Hussein or even a corrupt BC premier. But how do we get a handle on our thought struggles with control and authority, however they manifest themselves? How do we make sure that God has first place and last word in our lives? Today's reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50, offers some important words of guidance. I think, and its central message about our common calling to serve is pretty clear, especially when combined with his special concern for the slighted or excluded and for the weak. Our reading picks up where we left off last week, following the amazing event of the transfiguration when Christ has been revealed in glory with Moses and Elijah in that amazing scene on the mountaintop. Jesus has further confirmed his divinity by casting out a powerful demon from a young boy. He has already predicted his death and resurrection, but now he repeats that warning. They pass through Galilee, according to verses 31 to 32, and Jesus doesn't want anyone to know where they are because he's teaching his disciples. And what does he have to share? The Son of Man, he says, is going to be betrayed into the hands of people. They will kill him, and three days later he will rise. But of all the messages which Jesus tries to communicate to the disciples, this seems the most challenging for them. According to verse 32, they don't understand what he means and they're afraid to ask him about it. Presumably because they fail to grasp how a powerful Messiah, the one for whom they have longed for so long, could be betrayed and die, never mind rise again after three days. Eventually, they all reach the town of Capernaum, but on the way there, there's been another issue. In fact, an argument. Jesus knows this, and he asks them directly about it in verse 33. But the disciples are embarrassed. Like naughty children who've been caught misbehaving by their parents, they keep quiet and they say nothing. So it's left to Jesus to confront the issue himself, which he does in verse 35. The dispute has centered on the question of who is the greatest of the disciples, which may sound like rather a silly discussion to be having at all, but it's quite natural if you think about it. How often, after all, do we argue 
about the respective qualities of political leaders, sports stars, musicians, bosses, even preachers. Closer to home, how many have been tempted to measure our closeness to God by how much we do for the church, or perhaps in the deeper recesses of our spiritual pride to think ourselves better than others because of it. And what is Jesus' response? It's very simple. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all, he says in verse 34 following. Then he brings forward a little child, embraces him, and adds in verse 37, whoever welcomes one of these Little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So Jesus doesn't identify greatness with what or how many gifts or talents the disciples have, or with their success or, or fruitfulness in ministry. He pays no attention to the notches on their spiritual guns, as it were, Instead, he finds strength in weakness and leadership in service. It's those who are humbly willing to serve and to be kind and welcoming to others, especially the weaker members of the community whom Jesus commends most of all. And if we ask the basis for this teaching, we can not only return to verses 32, 30 to 32 and to Christ's prophetic description of his own role as the ultimate suffering servant which we are to emulate, we can and should also consider in verses 38 through 50 his attitude to outsiders and to those who lead the weakest and most precious of all astray. The great Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh wasn't always an artist. At one time, he wanted to become a pastor, and he was sent as a missionary to the Belgian mining district of Borinage in 1879. Van Gogh was obviously a man of conviction, so much so that when he discovered the deplorable working conditions and poverty-level wages of the local miners, he became concerned that his stipend from the church allowed him a more comfortable lifestyle. So one cold February evening, having seen an old miner trudging home across the fields wrapped only in a burlap sack, he's said to have laid out his own clothing, set aside enough for one change, and determined to give the rest away. Van Gogh donated a suit of clothes to the old man, and then his overcoat to a pregnant woman whose husband had been killed in a mining accident. He also began living on starvation rations and spending the money he had on food for the miners. When the children in one family contacted, contracted typhoid fever, he packed up his bed and took it to them, even though he was feverish himself. A prosperous family in the community offered him free room and board, but Van Gogh declined, arguing that he must reject this temptation if he was to serve his community faithfully. He believed that if he wanted them to trust him, he must live like them, and that if they were to learn of God's love through him, he must love them enough to share everything with them. Van Gogh was eventually dismissed from his post for the ridiculous charge of allegedly undermining the dignity of the church's ministry. And ultimately, of course, despite his tragic personal life, he went on to become posthumously recognized as a great artist. But such were the pastoral sensitivity, the personal compassion of Van Gogh, that they were also remembered 
despite the fame that his wonderful works of art eventually attracted after his tragic suicide. Just like Van Gogh, Jesus was also despised and rejected for his unconventional ministry and lifestyle. And there was no earthly reprieve for him when the living Son of God became a human being, when he embraced all the pain and hardship which that entailed. The New Testament teaches that Jesus gave up all the glories of heaven in order to reveal and enact God's saving love for us. And in the private instruction that he gives the disciples on their way through Galilee in verse 31, before they even get to Capernaum, we've already seen how Christ has plainly taught that his ultimate vindication will not come through earthly accolades at all. It will come through suffering and death on the cruel cross of Calvary before he rises again. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of others. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 31, he couldn't really put things much more plainly than that. But as we've also seen, the disciples aren't yet ready to understand his prophecy. They're afraid to ask him about it, and they're clearly in no position at this point to understand what this means in terms of their own call to service. In one sense, how could they be? It remains one of the greatest and most paradoxical mysteries of all about Jesus, even to many in the church, that the living Son of God, who is justly entitled to our full commitment and adoration, should have freely chosen to become a suffering, self-sacrificing servant for our sake. He not only welcomed, he personally identified himself with the weak and the outcast. In the timeless words of Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many in the most painful and yet glorious way imaginable. So when Christ as servant teaches his disciples the value of service in verses 33 to 37, he's already revealed how he has and how he will back up his words with the ultimate testimony of his life, death, and resurrection. He also leaves us all with a very challenging example to follow. And he extends that challenge in verses 39 through 50 when he underlines his special concerns for those rejected by others and for the weaker members of the church community. In a 2015 opinion piece for the New York Times, Jennifer Wiener told how she had watched her 97-year-old grandmother struggle with fitting into a new living situation at a retirement home, which featured, she reported, a brutal clique of what she called sweet old ladies. These women refused her grandma a place at their table, rejected her attempts to join their bridge group, and generally made her feel excluded and unwelcome, much like bullies of any age, wrote Vina of this perennial expression of fallen human nature. Whether you're brawling on the playground or battling over the best seats in chair exercise, bad behavior is constant, and the rituals for trying to get in with the in crowd don't change much. What a telling judgment and the Christian understanding of why this kind of selfish behavior happens is constant and it's consistent whether at 9 or 60 or 90. People are people and people are sinners. They're hurting, but they're also terse. 
all of us in need of the grace and mercy of God. In verses 38 through 41, we see the disciples first trying to enforce their own in crowd before Jesus enlightens them. Teacher, says John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. We told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. This is pretty pathetic, if you think about it. Here's a guy ministering deliverance to the demon-possessed, but the disciples are more concerned about whether he's part of their group than what his ministry is actually achieving. And sadly, of course, we can often see this kind of inward-looking elitism and control in all kinds of settings, including churches, especially when a small leadership group has too much influence and excludes others. Yet, Jesus' approach is far more open-minded, much more welcoming. He sighs here, as he so often does, with the outsider rather than with the insiders. Don't stop him, he says in verses 39 through 41. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Whoever is not against us is for us. We would all surely do well to remember this principle, especially in our increasingly post-Christian age when we can find ourselves with unlikely allies at times, and Jesus' compassion for the outsider and the vulnerable becomes even clearer in verses 42 through 48 when he turns to address the little ones who believe in me, by whom he, I think, he means the weaker members of the early growing community of his followers. Biblical warnings against false teaching are consistently strong sometimes even shocking in their language, and that only underlines just how vital orthodox teaching and those who offer it are to a healthy church. But Jesus' words here are more than enough to discomfort even the most confident gospel teacher. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, he says in verse 42, it will be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around his neck. What a terrifying image. And Jesus means it. He then goes on in verses 43 to 49 to discuss the gravity of sin in general, just how seriously he takes it, and I quote again in full, if your hand causes you to sin, Jesus says, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where Jesus concludes, quoting from Isaiah chapter 66, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted, or I think the meaning here is purified with fire. Over the years, some unfortunate and misguided Christians have taken these verses so seriously that they have literally disfigured themselves because they thought they needed to to get rid of various sins. But that was never Jesus' intention, of course. Instead, we find him using deliberately hyperbolic or exaggerated language to emphasize the gravity of sin. We should also be careful not to assume that Jesus 
is suggesting any kind of salvation or condemnation by works here, stressing the seriousness of sin and its consequences actually serves to highlight the mercy of God in offering forgiveness by grace through faith in Christ. And the prospect of hell, which is a very real one in Scripture, only remains for those who continue unrepentantly in sin without turning to Christ at all. So we are called to serve and to follow Jesus' sacrificial example, and that example includes showing concern for the slighted or the excluded and for the weaker members of our community. In that sense, to come to my last point, compassion and service go together. In her book, Pastoral Prayer Program, Sharon Price reports how for many years Albert Einstein had two portraits on the wall of his home, and they were both of great scientists, Newton and Maxwell. But towards the, the end of his life, the pioneering physicist and humanitarian took their pictures down and replaced them with those of two other leaders, Gandhi and Albert Schweitzer. When asked the reason for the change, Einstein explained that it was time to replace the image of success with the image of service. Replacing the image of success with the image of service is precisely what Jesus recommends to his disciples in Mark 9. Yet it seems to remain just as challenging for us today as it was for them nearly 2,000 years ago. And why so? Because if we're honest, many of us would rather run a lap of honor than walk the way of the cross. We prefer to lead than to follow and to be served rather than to serve. Yet our reading reminds us that true achievement or greatness in the Christian life are not so much decided by what we are recognized to have achieved as by our willingness and faithfulness in serving God and others, whatever the cost. It underlines that God's power and authority are often revealed through weakness and through self-sacrifice rather than brute force or strength. For as Jesus himself showed, it is when we welcome God's only Son in our hearts that we ultimately find God the Father. It's when we submit to God and when we're totally open before God that the Holy Spirit has most opportunity to work in and through us. It is when we humble ourselves and make ourselves available to serve, and it is when we care for the weak and the rejected in our midst that we truly follow Jesus' example. Let me close with a couple more quotations which really go right to the heart of the biblical ideal of service as we find it exemplified in the teaching and life of Jesus Christ. In his devotional book, In God's Presence, Regent College theologian Jim Packer notes that the two main Greek words translated servant in our English New Testament usually denote a person who is not at his own disposal, but it is his, his master's purchased property, bought to serve his master's needs, to be at his back and call every moment. The slave's sole business is to do as he's told. Christian service, therefore, means first and foremost living out this kind of servant relationship to one's Savior. And again, I quote, What work does Christ set his servants to do? The way that they serve him, according to Packer, is by becoming the slaves of their fellow servants and being willing to do literally anything, however costly, irksome, or undignified, 
in order to help them. That is what love means, as Jesus himself showed at the Last Supper, when he played the role of a servant and washed the disciples' feet. When the New Testament speaks of ministering to the saints, it means not primarily preaching to them, but devoting time, trouble, and substance to giving them all practical help possible. The essence of Christian service is loyalty to the king expressing itself in care for his servants. Loyalty to the king expressing itself in care for his servants. Arthur Tappan Pearson, who succeeded the great 19th century preacher C.H. Spurgeon in the pulpit of London's Metropolitan Tabernacle, was a prolific author as well as preacher. And in one of his works, he gave a particularly demanding but helpful definition of Christian service with which I'm going to leave you. Whatever is done for God, Pearson wrote, without respect of its comparative character as related to other acts, is service. And only that is service. Service is comprehensively doing the will of God. He is the object. All is for him, for his sake, as unto the Lord, not as unto others. Hence, even the humblest act of the humblest disciple acquires a certain divine quality by being done with reference to him. The supreme test of service is this. For whom am I doing this? Pearson continues. Much that we call service to Christ is not such at all. If we're doing this for Christ, we shall not care for human reward or even recognition. Our work must again be tested by three propositions. Is it work from God, as given us to do from him? For God, as finding in him its secret of power? And with God, as only a part of his work in which we engage as co-workers with him? Powerful questions indeed. And in the last verse of our reading, Jesus reminds us of our common calling to be salt, to be light, and to stay that way in what is often a corrupt and dark world. Salt is good, he tells his disciples in verse 50, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt. In other words, be ready to make a positive difference in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Be ready to make a difference and be at peace with each other. As we think about our own lives, about our own work, about our ministries, in light of the servant sacrificial example of Jesus in our reading, these words can surely challenge us all. They can also inspire us because humble, trusting service of God and others is precisely what Jesus recommends as the true fruit of faith. And even in a time like this, in fact, especially in a time like this, there are always plenty of opportunities to serve in very practical ways, and to glorify the God who sent Jesus Christ to be our servant king, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. of my mouth.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, and we welcome your divine presence with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are closer to us than we can ever be to each other, for you live in and among us by your Spirit. So we're not talking to each other when we pray. We have the wonderful high privilege of bringing our thanks and prayers to our living, loving God. We are so grateful for your promise that if we ask anything according to your will, you will not only hear us, but will grant our requests. So we pray in faith and we not only seek your will, we are determined to follow it to the best of our understanding, both personally and communally, as members of your body, the church. Thank you that you have adopted us into your family by grace through faith in Christ. So we belong together in a wonderful fellowship that we enjoy with you and with each other. Bind us together, we pray. Build us up as your people and help us to fulfill the God-given purposes that we share. We lift up all churches and missionaries bringing the good news of the gospel to others, including all whom we support as a congregation. But even as we ask this, Lord, we recognize that you are a holy as well as a merciful God and that our sins can separate us from you and divide us from one another. So we ask you to forgive our sins and offenses against you and against each other. Lord, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. We come here with different concerns, but many have to do with the needs of our world. We pray for those seeking to bring peace where there is war 
justice where there is injustice, provision where there is poverty, freedom where there is oppression, and especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, those seeking to bring healing where there is sickness. We pray for our political leaders at all levels. We know the challenges they face, and whether they recognize it or not, we know that they ultimately need the wisdom and understanding that can only come from you. Guide and direct them, we pray. Help them to make wise and positive decisions for the good of others and for the advance of your kingdom. We pray for our faith community here at Ebenezer and for our leaders and staff, for all our different ministries. We continue to seek the unity and growth of this congregation and the progress of the gospel in our neighborhood. We ask your guidance and direction as we reach out to others. We ask you to nurture and support all family and other relationships that we enjoy. Help us to love and support one another and to grow in grace together. We also recognize that some of our brothers and sisters in Christ are carrying heavy burdens. Some situations may be quite well known to us, while others remain unspoken. So we thank you that you, loving God, know our hearts. You know every last detail of our lives. You share every heartache and care. You are more than able to temper and calm every storm and to bring healing and wholeness, comfort and relief where needed. So we lift up those who are especially on our hearts right now, including all on our church prayer list and others whom we now remember quietly before you. Help each one of us, we pray, according to our several needs and necessities as we reach out to you. Thank you that while we may sometimes drift or go astray, our best walk with you is always onward and upward. May we conclude this time of worship with renewed strength, courage, and conviction for your service. And if we can be the means by which you answer the prayers of others, may we find May you find us neither deaf nor defiant, but keen to fulfill your plans and purposes. We pray all this in the powerful healing name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the name above all names. Amen. And our final hymn today is Jesus Paid It All.
As we come to the end of this time of worship together, I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining us and wish you all God's blessings uh, this coming week. And remember, if you want to know more about Ebenezer and the different activities and programs here, please turn to our website, where rockofhelp.com, where you'll find the details that you need, including a Bible study, a prayer meeting, a youth and young adults game night that are operating through this COVID shutdown. I was struck by the chorus of that last hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And where did Jesus pay the price? Where did he wash away our sin through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary itself, where he gave himself our servant king freely offered up his life as a living sacrifice to save us before he triumphantly rose again on the third day. If, watching this this morning, you already know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, may you be encouraged to renew your active service of him and to take all the opportunities that may come your way to serve. If you don't yet know him, please consider the gospel more deeply. And why not take the opportunity in the quietness of your hearts to accept Jesus Christ as the Savior from your sins, as the Lord of your life, to turn away from the past, to come to him in faith. Because I can assure you, God's word assures us that when we do that, everything, literally everything, changes for the better as we enter a new and eternal life with him. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Just now.